Conversations. We have them every day, unless we're hermits. Unless we just avoid everyone, we've had conversations about this, that, and the others. And I can even tell you that um, I even had a conversation about the Cowboys yesterday, and I had to go brush my teeth. <laughs> just kidding. They did win a game that didn't matter. But we talked about it. We have conversations about the weather. How many of you spoke at least a minute or two with somebody about how hot it is? And then somebody says, well, we got this nice breeze this morning. And you're sitting there thinking, man, I could be out working cattle. I could be working in my bed, but I'm going to go to worship Jesus today. And it's the way it works sometimes. We have conversations about all kinds of things, but there are conversations that matter most. And that is conversations about Jesus. Conversations about spiritual things. Way too often we find ourselves distracted by chasing rabbits of things that won't matter for eternity. Some things we talk about are good and they make sense. We saw a thousand pictures of first day of school this week. We get to talk about that and that's sweet and that's good. But folks... If we never have conversations about Jesus with those who do not know him, we have missed the boat. We have missed the ship on our purpose. You know, I, um, I received, a, well, let's just say it this way. You know, sometimes you make comments on Facebook being nice with somebody that, that you haven't actually spoken to in 17, 18 years. Y'all got those friends on Facebook like that, okay? I mean, you got people, you just don't see them often. And, and I made a little comment to a guy that, that, that was one of my NCOs when I, was, when I was a soldier, when I was a private, and he was, he, he, he was my direct supervisor, and, and he was a tough guy, and he was good. And out of the blue, he, he, me, he, he messages me and says, why don't we talk? And now he wants to talk on this face time stuff okay so I pulled it up and I'm looking at it and I'm like great but what happened is is we got to talking about where his life had turned out and how things were going and and I had an idea of what had been going on in his life some but you know you don't really know until you talk to somebody because Facebook is nothing more than a facade of what we want people to see right and if we're honest it's nothing more than a facade of what we want people to see. Very rarely do people share completely honestly and, 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 and completely, all right? So, and, and his thing was, is I, I, he says, man, I can't stand talking on the phone. I want to look people in the eye when I talk to them. I want to see how they're responding and how they're acting. And, and that's really hard when, when I'm on the phone or anything. I like to walk and talk, so that made it interesting. I'm sure he got seasick from seeing the background moving constantly, but... But you see, this guy, when I knew him, he was a hard-charging NCO. He was good at taking care of his soldiers. He's good at taking care of me and my buddy Murky. But it always seemed that he was always about that career. Very little about the things of faith. He had, he had religion, if you will, and I'm just going to use it just as loosely as that. But he wasn't interested in the things of God. He wasn't truly interested in knowing Jesus more. And we don't think about these conversations, but if I go back, I'm here to tell you that I was no different than any other person sitting in this pew. Just a church member. Just a guy that loved Jesus. Me and my buddy Tim, we'd be out in the middle of the wilderness of Fort Hood. We'd be out in the middle of the Mojave Desert. We'd be out on, on Fort Polk, Louisiana in the woods fighting mosquitoes. But we would find times to discuss the scriptures. We would find times to sing praises to God. We sang the worst hymns. Man, we, we would argue over how, what the rhythm of a hymn was. And because he is Methodist and I'm Baptist and, you know, Baptists are right, you know. Even though they had Charles Wetzley, but, and he wrote most of uh, so many of them. But the, the thing is, is we also, because we were Bradley crew, we had conversations with Sartinsky. Oops, said his name. It's all right, he won't mind. We had conversations, and he'd say, Strandberg, Murky, do you really give, your, give 10% to God, to that church? Yes, Art. 
Of course we do. We're supposed to. We don't do it because he tells us we have to. We do it because we love him. And he'd ask us questions and we would talk and he would get upset with us and blow us off. And, you know, I mean, I can. But anyway, we're so he calls me and we're, we're talking. And I'm. He says, Strandberg, I want you to know that when I got done with my military career, now he, he saw Afghanistan, he saw Fallujah, he saw it all, okay? He said, God got a hold of me. Brought, another, brought, a, brought a great woman into my life, we got married. He said, but in the process of doing all that, God kept talking. He kept putting people in my way. And I kept going back to those conversations that we had. He said, before I was baptized in my testimony, I shared, shared with them about the conversations we had with you and Murky. You see, we can talk about football. We can talk about the weather. We can talk about how worthless the politics are in this country. But that is only for a season and only for a time. But when we talk about Jesus, it has eternal impact. It matters longer and more than you ever thought. Because I want you to understand something. I really did not think very much was ever going to happen in his life. We talked to him. We hoped. We prayed. But you just didn't, you just didn't think it would happen. Don't underestimate the power of a conversation. So here we are. We have Jesus, and, and he's away from the crowds. It's nighttime, and there's this man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This is verse 1 going into 2. The man came to Jesus by night. He came to him by night. Now, some say he was coming in secret. I could see that because he wouldn't want to be associated with Jesus being a Pharisee, being a ruler of the Jews, probably a probably part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling class in, in, as well. But on the other hand, if you want to have a real good conversation with somebody, you see, Jesus was crowded all day long, people on top of people. You want to have a real good conversation, you find them when they're alone and it's one-on-one. -on -one. You don't think Jesus was tired, wore out from dealing with people all day? But yet this man, Nicodemus, came to him at night and Jesus took the time to talk with him, to speak with him one-on-one, -on -one, to have a conversation about things that are important, about things that truly matter. I'll tell you, one of my favorite things in the world to do is to break bread with someone. Because you learn more about somebody when you're eating than when you will in passing conversations or in group settings. So they're sitting there, and, they're, and, 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 and he approaches Jesus, and he says, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For, one, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. So he says, we know. So he's talking about other people. They see what's going on, and they're struggling with this, and, and he, is, he, is, he is seeking to know more. He wants to know more. And the avenue is there. We can see that, that he is pointing to the fact that Jesus is special because he says, you have come from God as a teacher. But notice he's not saying you have come from God as the Messiah. You have not, he's not saying you're the Savior yet. But he is walking a thin line. He is on the verge of wanting to believe something great. But he's holding on to something else, so he needs more conversation. He is drawn to Jesus. Now we know that he had seen signs and wonders. He had heard the teachings of Jesus out and about and around because we know that Jesus had a very public ministry and there were crowds of people who flocked to him. There are segue points in life where we can move a conversation 
to the things that matter. When we talk about our children, when we talk about our families, when we talk about life and joy and happiness and all of those things, we can bring any of that back around to Jesus. But in this case, they're talking about spiritual things. Rabbi, he honors him with the name teacher. Says he's an anointed teacher. He's from God. It's clear. But Jesus doesn't let it stay this far away. Jesus cuts to the chase. He cuts to the quick. Let's just be honest. He speaks very frankly and to the point. He, he, he grabs hold of the conversation and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you. I'll tell you the truth, friend. Come up here and listen. That unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, to be reborn from above. Because see, to be born again can, be, can also mean born above. Sometimes people get confused by just the phrase born again. But it equally can mean born from above, pointing to the divine coming and do so, doing something great, pointing to something greater than moving forth. He cuts straight to the point of where this conversation needs to go and where it needs to lead. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, we need to understand something about John's gospel and his understanding of the kingdom of God. As we go through this text, and we're not going to totally flesh that out today, but the kingdom of God has to do with the reign of Christ in our lives and experiencing eternal life. You will not see eternal life. You will not experience the reign of Christ in your life without being born again, without being made new, without being radically transformed and changed. We have to be made different. And this is Jesus who is dealing with one of the teachers of Israel, one of the rulers of the Jews, who is being called teacher. And really and seriously, what you have in this conversation is a contrast between the old and the new. Between what was and what is to be and what is to be now. We see a great conversation about what it means to be born again. Nicodemus Nicodemus looks and, and he does like anybody, and I would have asked the same question probably. Nicodemus says in verse 4, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? That's absurd. But you see, he should have picked up on the nuance of the Greek word for being born again, to be reborn. To be born again from above, something else is going on here. Something greater is being discussed. That's the thing about conversations. You ever get in a conversation with somebody about spiritual things and they go to the trivial things? I can remember a time I was once sitting, talking with a young man about Jesus. And I say young man, he's probably two or three years older than me at the time. But we were talking about this and a buddy of mine come up and kind of overheard and... Uh, he decided to bring up the, the, the sons of God up there and going, or the sons of angels and all that back there in Genesis for some reason. And we got way off. When someone tries to take the conversation to the trivial, bring it back. Bring it back to the essential. Bring it back to what is important. Don't get caught off in the weeds and the mud and all of this other stuff. How many angels can dance on the head of a pen? 5,603. Oh, I wasn't supposed to give you the answer? I thought, no. Who knows? But that happened to Christendom at one time. They got so busy worrying about everything else in the world that they forgot about the essentials. The essentials is the gospel message being shared with somebody else. The essentials is people hearing of Jesus and being reborn. That is the essential message. That's what matters. 
That's what changed everything. And for somebody's life, Jesus brings it back around. He doesn't waste his time with all of that. He says, Jesus answered and said in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, cannot experience the reign of Christ. What does it mean to be born of water? What does it mean and the Spirit? Now, most, and there are many of these arguments, some people will go all the way to just regular old, old baptism being a part of salvation for you, okay? There are, some, there are some different nuances that you can go with here. But many, especially in Baptist life, like to go to who else? John the Baptist. You know, because we, we've been around a long time, right? Goes to John the Baptist, and, and we see that in order to be reborn, one must be, what, baptized with water? Well, i got to find my spot. Born of unless one is born of water and of spirit. John the Baptist, what, did, what, was his, what was his baptism of? Think about it. Thank you. Repentance. It was a baptism of repentance. Not, was, was the baptism the most important part or was it the repentance? It was repentance that was the most important part. If you want to be born again, it's not about a water baptism. However, if you are a Christian in this room and you have not followed through with the ordinance of baptism, which is the first sign of obedience unto Christ, it's an outward sign of an inward change. That's your free Baptist advertisement. We can fill this thing in, in, in about two days, so don't worry. Let us know. We'll get it filled for you. Okay, if you know Jesus and you haven't been baptized, we can fix it because that's an outward sign of an inward change. That's a sign of obedience. That idea, it's not about the baptism itself. It's about the repentance in order to be born again, in order for the Spirit to come in and change your life, to make you anew. We must have repentance. We must confess our sins. We must repent. So that idea of being born of the water, to born, he would have known John's preaching. He would have known of all of that. Because remember, many Sadducees and Pharisees were doing what? Going out to hear John preach, weren't they? Many were baptized. And boy, old John, you just got to love John the Baptist, right? Old John looked at him. Oh, you brood of vipers. I just wanted to say that this morning. Who warned you? You want to know why we have conversations that matter? We have conversations about Jesus. Conversations that have eternal meaning. Because there is a need for our friends and loved ones, for our neighbors and strangers in our community. They need to be warned that if they are not born again, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. They will not experience the reign of Christ. They will not experience eternal life in his presence. So we see this picture of water, and we, we point back to John the Baptist in the baptism of repentance, but more importantly, repentance itself, to turn away from sin and self and to turn to God. But Jesus is not done there. He talks of the Spirit, and we'll get more on that in just a second. He fleshes this out. He covers it a little more. In verse 6, he says, that which is born of the flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit, Born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh. Now, we can go with the direction of what we were born. We're all born. We're all born the same way. None of us came into this world any differently, okay? Unless you were hatched, and that's, you know, that's highly unlikely, even though I tell my kids that. You were never told that as a child? Man, I was told that. My, my, my siblings were mean. But all of us were born. So what is of the flesh is of the flesh. But we can also see this a little different. What is works of the flesh? What is the law itself? Remember, remember, Nicodemus represents those, the teachers of the law, those who were following regulations. 
you know, here's the list of rules, get them done. That is self-centered, isn't it? That's self-focused upon ourselves. It's obvious in every way. Do this, do that. And hopefully, you know, somehow when it's all done and, I, you know, God does the judging, my scale will work out. I did more good than bad. The problem is, is no one is good. No, not one. No one does good. No, not one. But what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Verse 7, do not be amazed. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. You must be reborn from above. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from or where it is going. There's a mystery. There's a mystery, as Billy Graham would say. There's a mystery to it. And yet you accept it as real and true because you experience it. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. There's a mystery to it, but it works. Flesh is of the flesh, works of the flesh, works of our own hands or our own control. But things of the Spirit are greater than us. It is the Spirit that transforms us, that changes us, that saves us. We can't save ourselves. There's a mystery to how we are born again. And, and if you wanted to, you could even talk about being baptized by the Holy Spirit right here. There's a mystery, but the thing is, it works. And it is only a work of God that can make us born from above. There is nothing we can do to make that happen. It is God who draws us to Jesus. It is God who does the saving. Notice he doesn't give him this clear and perfect answer. He points to a ministry, mystery and, and exclaims it works. It happens. But Nicodemus is one who just not getting it. How can these things be? How can this this, this just makes no sense. This isn't rational. You know what? The scientists at the CDC have not proved it, so therefore it ain't. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you read all your articles, and I tend to keep a lot of articles, just about everything in your house will kill you and give you cancer. It's true. There's a study to support every bit of it. And I'm not making light of getting cancer. I'm just making light of science. Because they're trying, and they've done some amazing things. But they haven't figured it all out yet. They haven't got it all figured out. And Nicodemus being a man of the old things, and Jesus being new things, and, 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 and trying to hold strict to the law, but he's seeking Jesus. He's interested Jesus in verse 10 answered him and said, Are you the teacher, are you the teacher of Israel? And do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. You're not a are you not a teacher of Israel? You know that old testament is complete with references to the coming of the Spirit, to being made new in the Spirit. 
just to give you a couple, and you're welcome to jot down the verses. Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. You will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put in you a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Let's see, which direction? Isaiah 32, 15. Until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. Joel, chapter 2, 28. It will come after this, that I will pour my spirit on all mankind, and it goes on to talk about them prophesying. The scriptures, the scriptures have been pointing to a day in which mankind would be born again. That not just the prophet, not just the king would have the spirit of God, but all who believe, all who are followers of God, to be made new, to be born again, to be born from above. He was pointing to a teacher of Israel who should understand the scriptures. He's having a conversation. On what they had known. Now, obviously, Nicodemus is a little more advanced than most. But yet, Jesus doesn't run down quoting all the passages, but he was referencing that you should know this already. And he said, you know, we know what we know and testify of what we have seen. What is he talking about? Jesus had come. Everybody knew that he had gone to John the Baptist and been baptized. Everybody heard about what he was preaching. They had heard and seen the signs and wonders that were taking place. And yet they would not believe. You see, we truly never understand until we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We never truly understand until we, too, are born again. So Jesus looks at him, and he draws one more direct comparison between the old and the new. And he said, if I told, verse 12, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, Jesus talking about himself, from heaven, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To be born of water, repentance. And born of the Spirit. Being born of the Spirit is when Jesus is lifted up. Now some of you are saying Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness. That's a, that's a reference back to Numbers. When they had, the Israelites had sinned against God, so God sent in a bunch of snakes to bite them and kill them. When they cried out to God, God said, put the serpent, bronze serpent up on a pole. The fiery serpent, if you look at it, you'll be healed. And it was done so. But now salvation is coming again. But salvation coming for one to bring eternal life. 
You see, the men and women of Israel who looked upon that serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness, they were saved that day, but they were ultimately going to die. They were not going to experience eternal life in Jesus, the Messiah. So even must the Son of even so the so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In reference to him being raised up on the cross. Being raised up on the cross, Jesus said elsewhere, he said. If I get on the right page, I'll tell you what he said elsewhere. He says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. He was pointing to the cross and his death. So that whosoever believes will in him have eternal life. You see... Nicodemus was a Pharisee of Pharisees. The difference between him and Paul is Paul would have just went ahead and stoned Jesus, okay? He was a little more questioning and a little more curious. But they were both meticulous men in following the law, trying to do good and do right. And, 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 and what they thought was right, according to the law of men more than the law of God, they kept looking to themselves, if I could be just a little better, if I could do just a little more. But folks, if we are to be born again, we have to stop looking to ourselves and start looking up to him. You see, if we're going to have conversations that matter. The conversation cannot be focused on us. It has to be focused on the one who has done so much for us. It has to be focused upon the one who does change lives. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Conversations that matter for all eternity are the ones that point people to Jesus. That invite them to look up to him. That's why I love that cross being up there. You can have the best planned argument in the world for your discussion with your lost and wayward friend. But you see, and do that, plan. We are the, not the ones that save. We are not the ones that cause people to be born again. It is only when we point them to Jesus that they can be born again by the Spirit. So if you're here today and you never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never been radically changed by meeting Jesus, because I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm not the man I was before I met Jesus. And nor should we ever act like that person again. Once we are born again, we are radically changed. When we repent and we believe in Him. We receive eternal life, which means we get to enjoy the reign of Jesus. We get to enjoy His presence for all time. But until he comes again, we must be serving him. So if you don't know him this morning, I'm going to be standing right here in our invitation. And I will show you from God's word what you need to know to be saved. Maybe you're here this morning.
and you got a friend, a loved one, that you haven't had that conversation with. You know you need to. You know you're supposed to. But you keep avoiding it like the plague. Oh, but they're so much smarter than me. They're so committed to being an atheist. They're so committed to being this, that, and the other. You know, Nicodemus was a teacher of Israel. He was a leader. And yet Jesus had a simple conversation with him. Nicodemus later spoke up for Jesus when they were accusing him. Nicodemus was so changed by one conversation that mattered that he helped Joseph Joseph of Arimathea prepare and bury Jesus. Don't underestimate your words in pointing people to Christ. For you never know when a soul will be saved. It might not be today. It might not be next week. It could be in my situation with an NCO, with a sergeant who looked like he was going nowhere fast spiritually. To today, he's retired, has a family, and he's faithfully serving the Lord. Never underestimate telling others about Jesus high and lifted up. Let's quit looking at ourselves and focus on him. Let us pray. Father God.